Um, I'm sure some of you have already attended some of the fantastic events of the festival. I'm just going to say something about the festival and then we'll uh, introduce the event. So Being Human is the UK's only festival of the humanities. Um, I believe it's um, taking place in over 45 towns and cities across the country. It is led by the School of Advanced Study, University of London, in partnership with Parts and Humanities Research Council and the British Academy. Um, we're very proud to have such a, uh, a rich and diverse uh, agenda of events. Uh, again, I'm told about 250 events running till uh, Friday, this time Friday. Um, Thank you all again for coming and a warm welcome to our speakers. I believe some of them, most of them, are here with us. Uh, again, we're very proud to have a distinguished and diverse panel of uh, speakers. Um, today we'll be discussing uh, matters related to creativity. So, what is the creative mind? What defines creativity? And how can we encourage interdisciplinary dialogue? of creativity. We do that in the spirit of the Human Mind Project. And again, let me say just a few words about what we do and our mission. Uh, but the Human Mind Project is one of the central initiatives of the School of Advanced Study. Um, it was launched in late 2013. Uh, it is a research program, despite the name, meaning we do very many different things, including events of this kind. Um, and what we're trying to achieve is, in a way, to define the key questions, we call them the current challenges facing the study of the mind nowadays. How do we do that? Well, in the spirit of this event, in a very interdisciplinary way, by trying to integrate the arts and humanities with the best science of the day, natural and social sciences. Um, before I uh, 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 invite our project leader, Colin Blakemore, to join me and introduce our distinguished speakers, I'd like to say a few words uh, about the questions of the day. So we asked our speakers uh, to uh, give us uh, a question, the question that they think drive their research projects. Uh, and this is a list uh, of opening questions. I'm sure that by the end of the day we'll come up with many more questions, perhaps different from this list. But I'd like to invite you to keep these questions in mind while the speakers will deliver their short talks in the morning. And then, of course, we'll have group discussions in the afternoon. Um, again, uh, before I hand over to Colin, uh, just a few practicalities. Uh, um, we have a, a splendid team of people uh, helping us today. For the first time, the Human Mind Project has teamed up with Guerrilla Science. And Guerrilla Science is a creative organization that designs events, science-inspired events, installations like this one. Um, so I'm grateful for the work, for the, for the help, and I'm going to introduce some of them now. Uh, well, if you want to have a look, these are, uh, this is the logo of Guerrilla Science. Uh, thanks to Jack Wong, uh, Pigal Tevacoli, and Marisa Shazam for their excellent and very enthusiastic contribution in designing and running uh, the project, uh, the event. And then, of course, uh, thanks, uh, for, uh, thanks to the team of the Human Project, and especially our project officer, who's running where's she, Anna Hopkins, with our postdocs, uh, Sophia Bonifazi, and Maury Hertz, and our digital manager, Matt Philbot. Um, and again, thanks to the team of Being Human. Uh, all right, I see, um, I think we are ready to, uh, to start. Um, um, yes, we have, uh, actually our um, chair for the morning session. Uh, he has joined us, uh, Professor Barry Smith, the director of the Institute of Philosophy in the School of Advanced Study. Um, 
I'm going to hand over to him for introducing our speakers. I'll be around all day if you have any questions. Thank you again for joining us and enjoy your creativity and the mind. So we're delighted to uh, begin and no person I think more appropriate to begin with for creativity in the mind than Professor Margaret Bowden from the University of Sussex. Maggie um, started, founded uh, a cognitive science program there, uh, one of the first and uh, still one of the most important cognitive science centres we have in the UK. Uh, she has been a vice president of the British Academy and her work uh, is not only uh, read and enjoyed within the Academy but is widely distributed outside that uh, with a lot of uh, public engagement and a lot of discussion of her work on the BBC uh, and translated into many languages so made available to a wide range of people. Her books include The Creative Mind, Myths and Mechanisms, Mind as Machine, A History of Cognitive Science, Creativity and Art, Three Roads to Surprise, and her latest book um, is AI is Nature and the Future. So would you welcome Professor Margaret Bowen. How the current limitations of AI um, impact on computer art, <coughs> and in fact abstract certain ideas, projects that people might have in computer art. And um, I've said in my writings that some of which Barry referred to that there are three sorts of creativity, which I call combinational, exploratory, and transformational. Now, I think it's very important to note that there are those three sorts, uh, but mostly people only just talk about the first, combinational. And actually, <coughs> excuse me, I am going to. <coughs> take examples only from combinational creativity this morning, but I wouldn't want you to think that that's the only sort of creativity, because it isn't. But what combinational creativity is, in general, is making unfamiliar combinations of familiar ideas. The ideas, they may be verbal, linguistic, they may be musical, they may be imagery, whatever, but in general, that's what combination of creativity is. And you might say, well, that must be a doll for computer art. I mean, you know, nothing could be easier than writing a program to get a computer program to make new combinations of the ideas, the data, the concepts, the images that it already has. Well, that, of course, is true. Nothing could be easier than doing that. The question is whether what you get is going to be valuable at all. Mata has said a moment ago, we need to um, try and define creativity. I define creativity as the ability to come up with ideas that are new, surprising, and valuable. Now, if you have this sort of random sorting program, you're certainly going to come up with stuff that's new, you're certainly going to come up with stuff that's surprising, but rather rarely, I suggest, are you going to come up with something that's valuable. Um, and indeed, to get the computer program itself to tell the difference between things that we regard as valuable and therefore creative um, and things that we don't um, is quite another matter, and we'll come back to that. So you might say, well, uh, okay, um, there are going to be difficulties here, but there have been huge changes in AI recently, you might say. You'd be wrong, because that in a certain sense, because the ideas behind those ideas are at least 30 years old. Um, but I'm talking about so-called deep learning. Um, has anybody here heard that expression, deep learning? Has anybody here heard of the computer program that beat the world champion in Go in March? A few more, yes. 
Well, there had, uh, that was a uh, very unexpected, at least 10 years early, uh, in regard of the predictions of the uh, experts in the field. And there's been a lot of fuss about it. Um, and in general, the um, area of machine learning has suddenly sort of hit the newspapers, hit the press, hit the media in general. <coughs> As I said, not because of any fundamentally new ideas. The ideas that they're exploiting actually um, were worked out about 30 years ago, 25, 30 years ago. But with increased computer power that we uh, suddenly have, and including um, the possibility of having uh, hugely larger stores of data um, to play around with, um, results like the AlphaGo example, results have happened which are truly astonishing, new, different, and impressive. I'm not trying to say this stuff isn't impressive. Uh, but, um, so you might say, well, couldn't we use that to come up with combinational creativity in computer art? And I'm going to consider, just because one has to think of specific examples, I'm going to consider uh, visual art. I'm not going to be talking about um, other sorts of art here. I'm going to talk about visual art. Um, <coughs> Deep learning, which I mentioned, is, to put it incredibly simply, using neural networks, which, are, uh, which have many different levels, multi-level neural networks. Now, many may mean seven, it may mean 77, may mean 177. But multi-layer neural networks, where, in general, what happens is, you give them some data. It may be um, a complicated uh, set of visual data, or it may be medical data from national health records, whatever it is. And the system manages to uh, find patterns uh, in this data at each level. And at each level, the output of the lower level is fed in as the input to the level above and so on and so on, until you get to the last couple of metrics where it's more interesting in the way things happen. Um, so that you get, if you like, not just um, pattern recognition, but a recognition of the structure, the, the many level structure of the data. That's why it's called deep learning. Okay. Um, and some people, uh, have suggested that you run this backwards to do what's sometimes called deep dreaming. Uh, in other words, it's possible to use one of these systems um, not to find the structure of an image or a set of images which you give to it, but to generate new images, bottom up, so to speak. Um, either, in, in one of two ways, either by picking one or more, well, normally two, at least two sorts of image that it has in its database at random and put them together and, you know, tapping around with them in a random way, really, and seeing what comes out. Um, the other way is for you to decide on two or more images and make it faff around with those. And so, for instance, you can take a, um, the Mona Lisa or a portrait of your father, a photograph of your father, and um, a dog's face, and um, press the button, and the thing will come up with indefinitely many, I mean, in principle, infinitely many indefinitely many um, crazy, strange images um, which combine your father's face with dog's faces and which not just have them next to one another, but have them, in some cases, sort of integrated. So part of your father's face is actually a dog's nose, and so on. 
and people have been um, playing around with this. Now, that probably, uh, and when I say it's new and surprising, that's certainly true. Personally, I don't think it's particularly valuable. I mean, um, what that reminds one of, of course, and what some people have compared it to is collage, a whole genre of visual art, which it depends on combination of creativity. So collage, I'm thinking, for instance, of um, the sorts of um, images of pictures of um, guitars and violins that Picasso uh, did when he was the first one to do this sort of thing, where um, they're really, they're representational images, really. It's clearly a violin, it's clearly a guitar. Um, but it isn't just one picture. It's scraps, of, and using different paper, for example, different types of paper, and, and so on. And the person who really um, took this to a new sort of art form, generally regarded as the master of collage, was um, who didn't come up with representational, pseudo representational pictures like guitars, he, he came up with abstract. So he might have a really very famous image of, of I apologize for not having slides, but I don't do gizmos. Um, he has um, a very famous picture called the cherry picture. The reason it's called the cherry picture is it's a whole lot of completely unrelated, apparently unrelated images, of which one is a pair of cherries, happens to be near the center of the picture, and it happens to be visually quite salient because of the red color of the cherries. And that really is the only reason it's called the cherry picture, because it has nothing to do with cherries. Apart from having that little image, nothing to do with cherries. In fact, it has nothing to do with anything. It's not only abstract, it's the, the, the things on it seem to be um, just chosen randomly, almost, and we'll come back to this, almost, I want to say, placed randomly, that's not quite right, of course, but certainly chosen randomly. Um, so you might say, well, why would a computer, possibly one of these deep, deep dreaming things, um, do that? Why couldn't you ask it to pick, I don't know, 20 different images at random? And um, as I put it so uh, technically earlier, back around with them in the way that it does and come up with um, a collage. Well, it would come up with something, of course. Um, but the problem is that if you look at hu human generated collage, as I say, they may not have any clear uh, principle of relevance linking the parts. They may not be obviously guitars, obviously violins. They may be like the cherry picture, which has got the cherry in it. It's got, um, oh, a little sort of kitsch picture of two kittens. It's got, um, I think, a bus ticket or a theater ticket and so on. Uh, doesn't make any sense. But visually, it is arresting. It is interesting. I don't know whether I would say it was beautiful. Certainly, some people would, but it wasn't beautiful. Uh, but clearly, Schwitzers wasn't doing it randomly. If, for example, he had picked up all these little bits of stuff and had a, um, a canvas, blank canvas ready, with sort of glue on it. And he throws them all, does a, a Jackson Pollock, if you like, <laughs> throws them all into the bottom left-hand corner. So they're all there in the bottom left-hand corner. That wouldn't look right. It doesn't have visual balance, OK? And clearly, there must be many more um, visual judgments which he was making in deciding, A, what to place, but B, where to place these things in the image. We don't know what those are. I don't know whether art historians who specialize in Schwitters could say very much about what they are either. 
Um, but the point is, if you wanted to use deep dreaming as a technique to do collage, you'd have to be able to say what at least some of those important uh, visual relevance principles are. So you'd be, have to be able to do that. And I suggest that that would be very, very difficult, if not impossible. Um, I don't mean impossible in principle, but uh, impossible in practice. You'd have to do it in language first. And then, if provided you'd managed to do that, you'd have to uh, put it into the program. And the problem there is that even if uh, you managed to identify these principles of visual relevance uh, clearly, um, you couldn't actually put them into a deep dreaming system because deep learning in general, um, including the program that um, beat the uh, Go champion, are black boxes. The people who, are, who wrote them don't really understand what they're doing. Of course they understand the basic algorithm they wrote the system. But they don't understand uh, what's going on. They can't predict what's going on. They would not be able, I'm not saying it will never be the case, but at the moment, they would not be able to guide the deep dreaming system to come up with collage like this, rather than collage like that because they don't know how to control the system because, or even guide the system because they don't know at that sort of level of description how the, the system works. So that is a very important limitation of current AI which um, means that although at first sight it looks as though it could be used for this sort of artistic purpose, I suggest it could not. Uh, one of these days, maybe, but at the moment, not. Um, now, there is somebody actually sitting in this room, Simon Colton, who's going to be talking to us later, who has done work on computational impunity on collage. Uh, <coughs> and he's, he's not doing the deep gene, a completely different, um, if you like, a, a more sort of traditional form of programming. But the point is, he has done work on collage, and, and one of the images which uh, you can see in this published work is a collage on the um, theme of war. And it has about, I don't know, perhaps eight, is it eight different images in it, maybe nine. ten, nine, whatever. Yeah, that's right. And one of them is um, a plane, black fly, and one of them is a, a mother and child uh, distressed clearly distressed mother and child. Another is war graves. Okay, so there is this image. Now the relevance problem is solved here, but not in a visual way. The relevance problem is solved because Simon also has um, a system which will um, search the uh, text of headlines of the newspaper and um, on the one hand identify the salient words and of course salient words tend to happen in the headlines so. uh, and can use you know, uh, if you like verbal pattern recognition to pick out words that relate to one another okay so uh, so for example uh, it can pick out the word war and the various other words and images, well sorry, the, the language part just picks out the words related to war, which it finds in the newspaper articles, okay? So that's all, so they're all co-relevant, okay? And it's done in terms of you know, association of, of, of words in, in ordinary texts. So the relevance is there. Visually, if you like, it's Kate, then it can, the collage program can pick out imagery in the newspapers which accompanied those headlines and basically use that imagery, pick that out and use that imagery to make the collage. So relevance here is not a problem. I'm not talking about visual relevance here, I'm talking about, if you like, thematic relevance. Thematic relevance is solved here because of the linguistic 
effects of uh, the way the thing, the system treats the theme, in this case of war. But I don't know, and I, it's not clear from Simon's, you know, the published stuff about this thing. I don't know how the system makes the choice as to where to put the nine images. They have nine times um, there is that choice. Now it has. Exactly. That's what it looks like. That's right. It, it, it's random. So, and, uh, no, I mean, you may have an interesting ninefold image there about war. It makes you think about various things and, and so on. So it has a, a, a value, but um, it isn't what we normally understand as collage. There is no... Uh, notion there of what would be a right placement, what would be a wrong placement, etc., etc. Uh, and I would say for two reasons. I mean, partly because, as I said before, it's very difficult for human art historians to say what those principles are. That's part of it. But secondly, if one were able to say what they are, um, some of them might well require quite fancy computer vision. Now, actually, to be fair, uh, call, uh, Simon's system called the Painting Fool uh, does actually have pretty fancy computer vision compared with most computer vision in AI. It does, actually. I mean, if anybody at the moment could do it, possibly Simon might be able to do it. But I would say, he certainly hasn't done it there. Maybe he couldn't do it yet, but whoever whoever does it one of these days is going to have a very uh, much fancier computer vision um, facilities than current AI can offer us. And let me finish by just mentioning one more example. It isn't strictly speaking collage, it's what I call a visual pun, but it's in some ways similar to collage. I expect you've all seen those amazing pictures, I think they're 17th century, from Giuseppe Archibaldo. They're faces or human figures um, made, for example, of vegetables, a, a lot of different vegetables. So a human face is actually made up of, of vegetables or of, of um, fish and, and uh, uh, sea, sea creatures. And they're extraordinary. Um, if you don't know them, do go and look them up on Google. Archimbaldo, A-R-C-H-I-M-B-A-L-D-O. Um, extraordinary stuff. Um, now, to, to have composed those images, and for that matter, for you appreciating them, I mean understanding them uh, when you see them, to understand what's going on here, requires very uh, subtle, uh, I would say, quite subtle um, facility, quite subtle uh, powers of visual comparison and recognition. If you don't have those, you not only can't do Archimbaldo, you can't understand Archimbaldo, you can't get the point. And if you ever wanted to have a type of computer art doing the same sort of thing, you would need to have those sorts of facilities. So those are just three reasons. Black boxery, problems of relevance, lack of visual uh, subtlety, those three things which at the moment are uh, preventing AI, in this particular area anyway, um, from being really much use at all. I think. Well,